This is a production of Cornell University. Yeah, thanks everyone for, for tuning in again to the Cornell Turf Show. This is episode four, season four. Uh, today we're going to have a nice, lively uh, lawn and landscape conversation. Uh, Dr. Kale Bigelow uh, is a professor of horticulture at, I don't know, Kale, do I, do I want to say the university yet? You had a rough time in the NCAA tournament. Maybe, maybe we'll just call it a university in Indiana, uh, but, but we don't, we don't want to attract much more attention. <laughs> at, at an elite Big Ten university. That's elite the best Big way. Ten university, yeah. <laughs> I picked them to name? win, Kale, just so you know, I picked them to win. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes things don't. That's why they play the games, right? So yeah. we'll, we won't talk too much more about sports. We're going to be talking a lot about grass today. Yeah. Uh, but I'll bring in my, my co-host as always, Frank Rossi. Uh, Frank, we're, we're sort of getting to the, the growing season here. Maybe we're going to see a little pause here up in, up in the Northeast, but uh, interested to see uh, what you're thinking of, of the growing season so far and, and things you're seeing, uh, seeing out there these days. Okay. All right, Carl, you got me? Yep. You got me to see the slides? Mm -hmm. All right, good. Cal, thanks for joining us. Everybody, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Um, we're back at it. Uh, the fastest 30 minutes. Uh, it, it is actually one of the highlights uh, of this time of year. We're going to have a little uh, disruption, I think, in the next couple of weeks in some way, shape, or form because everybody's life seems to be back to normal, Cal. People are traveling. It's hard to get people around uh, at this time of day. Uh, it was really easy when we were all locked up, right, Carl? But not so much, uh, not, not so much uh, anymore. We're sort of back at it. Now, speaking of back at it, I got this picture from a student in the Great Lakes School of uh, Turfgrass Management, the one we teach um, through the University of Minnesota and Sam Bauer, Greenkeeper people. Uh, this guy uh, is, this is Fort Greene Park in Brooklyn just about a, a, a three blocks from uh, Greenwood Cemetery where I've been doing some work. And this is what happens in urban parks, especially when you let the four legged ones there, right? This is pretty standard for what happens in these parks, Carl. And you know, I know you've got something to say about the value of these parks and you know, the different experience it would be if maybe that wasn't dirt uh, in the middle of Brooklyn. So I'll leave it to you from there to set up the context for your rant on ecosystem services today. Yeah, so, so I don't know if I'll call this a rant today, Frank, but really just sort of what we're interested in these days. Um, this term ecosystem services, some people may or, may or may not have heard about this, but really very simply, this is the value we as humans get out of ecosystems. Uh, and, and this was a cool paper from, from the folks here at Cornell, Grant Thompson was here when he was here, Jenny Kowniffin, and they sort of segment these ecosystem services out uh, specifically for turf grass. So we can have uh, provisioning services. Turf grass gives us things like uh, sod or, or ground cover. Uh, we're just looking at an image of a lot of bare dirt. It would be much better if we had some turf covering that to reduce soil erosion, reduce sediment uh, getting into our water bodies. Uh, speaking of water bodies, regulating services, uh, turf can sort of regulate the water cycle. It can accept a lot of rain. It can promote infiltration as opposed to runoff. Uh, it can filter out a lot of pollutants, right? That sediment that's that's floating around, uh, nutrients it can handle. Um, so that's a, that's a value we as humans get uh, out of turf. And then cultural services is really sort of the traditional way we think about valuation in turf. The Great American Lawn, Levitt Town, the origin story, it looks really good. Uh, there's certainly value in that, uh, but there's also value in, in these functioning for us, uh, kicking a ball around, having a picnic, right? Playing golf, playing uh, all these other sports. Those are cultural services. Uh, and then supporting services, things like soil formation and nutrient cycling. But what I'm interested in, what we're interested in these days, Frank, is, is turf grass in urban areas. So turf grass is where people are. Uh, you can see a little image here for those watching of, of fractional turf grass air, area in the United States, and it's centralized in metropolitan areas. Maybe that's a little bit counterintuitive, um, but there's a lot of turf where people are. Almost nine out of 10 people now are living in urban areas uh, in the United States. So it's, it's pretty important. It is where people are. We can have some valuation there, specifically in New York. Our, our turf grass survey from 2003 is pretty dated, but said we had about 11% of our land cover in New York uh, as turf grass. So there's a lot of turf. It is where people are. Uh, and it's it's interesting for us to sort of look at the value of that. Um, so when you look at some regulating services, specifically the the stormwater and runoff component, um, you know, turf grass as a filter, as opposed to impermeable surface. So if you build a parking lot as opposed to having a 
a park or an athletic field, uh, you're going to have to build all the pipes to handle all that runoff, right? That water's got to go somewhere. We got to handle that. We got to maintain those pipes. So there's studies that have looked at this and have tried to do that cost benefit analysis. And they say, hey, these urban green spaces, these turf grass areas, they're worth at the low estimate, $1,300 to $8,000 per acre per year in, in that sort of stormwater control, runoff control. That's a lot of a lot of money when you start adding that up over you know 20 acre parks, 150 acre golf courses, right? So there's some value in there that maybe we don't realize. Uh, provisioning, right? Giving us other value, uh, home value, right? For every dollar you invest in your home landscape, you get about $1.35 back. There's some ROI there. Also, if you live near an urban green space, that house, that same house is worth more than if you live further away. Uh, and then there's these other things that are really hard to value. Things like when you live near a quality urban green space, uh, you have more improved physical and mental health for for adolescents and kids, that's huge, living near urban green space, removing stress, social cohesion, all, you know, COVID really sort of magnified that value. Uh, so we get a lot of these things from turf grass. Uh, but maybe maybe here's why I rant today, Frank, is, is we have to manage these areas well to extract that value, right? So here's a great image from Ignatieva and the Australian group looking at urban lawns. On the left side of the screen, you see all that ecosystem service value, carbon sequestration, cooling of and mitigation of the heat island effect, regulating the water cycle. Hey, that's great. We like that. But on the left side, we say, hey, if we manage these areas poorly, maybe we're overusing resources or underusing resources, we can create ecosystem disservices, right? If we've got a sparse, weedy lawn and we're kicking up dust mowing in, in the summer, right, there's air pollution. Uh, if, if we don't have, if we're overusing fertilizers or pesticides, right, there's chance of leakage out into the water bodies, right? Supporting biodiversity, if we, if we put too much into the system, uh, maybe we're sort of uh, creating a more homogeneous, um, uh, you know, soil microbe population, and that's maybe not good. So really, it depends on how we manage these areas, and, and we really have to be thoughtful to to maximize this positive end of, of the equation and, and minimize the, the negative end. What do you think, Cal? I think it's all good stuff, personally. You know, I, I think the one, uh, the third one down there, regulating air quality. Uh, you've probably seen it. I've certainly seen it. Uh, these robotic mowers, right? So suddenly that thing that's on the right-hand side maybe is not as big an issue, you know, in the future. Because I, mm -hmm. I genuinely think that these robotic mowers, these electric mowers are going to, uh, certainly going to provide some help there. And, and and that's gonna reduce some of those greenhouse gases. So, but yeah. Yeah, there's no no question about that. If you look at some of the things on the on the right that are disservices, they, a few of them come from just burning fuel uh, to mow. And, and that is the thing, Carl, you're exactly right. All the good intentions to have parks uh, with grass for people to use because it's culturally a part of our society. Uh, and all we do is mow it. It doesn't look so good sometimes uh, when we don't care for it as much as we could. All right. I'm, I'm really glad. Uh, and now I just add one more thing. Hardly any of that work is from the United States. I think some of the valuation is, right? Some of the stormwater value and some of the home expenses are U.S. data, right, Carl? Yes, they yeah, are. Yeah, the home expense stuff is, is what we care about in the, in the United exactly States. That's exactly right. right, right. <laughs> we, don't care about the, we don't care about the other ecosystem services. Anyway, uh, just an update on, on, you know, for the grounds and lawn and landscape folks, this is our uh, every other week. Uh, last week, we had some sports stuff with Ben Palmer. Um, and this week, we'll do just a general walk through grounds, uh, lawn and landscape stuff as we get going. And as you get going, it's hard to not know that the season has gotten going. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Forsythia blooming in Riverhead out on the eastern end of Long Island, uh, February 22nd this year. So this is a, a really uh, a profound effect, but also, Carl, a manifestation, a bit of uh, urbanization, right? You got a lot of buildings, even though Riverhead is a little more rural, there's still a fair amount of pavement out there. Now, looking at heat accumulation, just draw everybody's attention to the forecast website the Turfgrass uh, Weather website we've managed now since 2004. Um, we've got some changes to it. Um, some of the tables along the top that used to be colors now have uh, behind normal. Uh, and uh, in this case, we're looking at degree days uh, over the last week. Um, we're about nine days behind normal this week compared to last year. Uh, became, I'm sorry, compared to the 30-year average. So we're a few days behind normal you have a graph of it now you can also look at the gray line on the website 
and see what the forecast is, right? So we're going to remain uh, behind uh, moving forward. Very easy way to uh, pay attention to these maps. Really work good on the, on the phone, too. We've set them up, really, to work very good in that adapted mode. Um, and so just a couple of things about the natural world you might be observing and what other models are telling us. This is uh, Kevin Frank and the folks at Michigan State, the GDD, the GDD tracker. Um, this is relative flowering times for broadleaf weeds, uh, uh, something we're going to be talking about uh, a little bit today and moving forward, you know, as we continue to be concerned about maintaining that biodiversity, which includes uh, some flowering plants potentially uh, in the lawn. Uh, we've got some early season winter annuals making their way into the New York metropolitan area and south. So as you get to the southern part of the region, you're starting to see those early winter annuals already making uh, getting close to flowering, uh, which means they're too big or too late for control, uh, depending on how advanced they are. And just a heads up, because we won't see it for a couple of weeks, you got a couple of weeks to start worrying about crabgrass germination, especially that this week we don't think we're moving very far. And Cal, it looks like this has already or made its way out to you. You're, you're also not ready for crabgrass germination, and usually you're a little bit ahead of us uh, anyway. So we have some maps on here for broadleaf weed control. Some of this research, I think, actually happened at Purdue many years ago when Riker and Throssell were there. Uh, this is the early season 2-4-D model for a dandelion control using either an amine or an ester formulation. And again, you can see we're not going anywhere. You, you, you don't have to worry about getting a sprayer out and doing spot spraying or anything yet. If you have to make uh, applications in the spring, we all know this isn't the preferred time to make those applications, but if you do at least a little bit of data to guide you. Soils are still pretty cool, right? We've noticed this. They were in the fifties a couple of weeks ago and now you know, into the 30s and 40s again here in the Northeast, uh, low, you know, mid 40s at best, even in the metropolitan areas where some heat islands can occur. Uh, some other interesting things going on at the forecast website, the way we're depicting some of the water uh, rainfall events uh, that are happening. We're building a, a lawn watering tool, calls uh, building a lawn watering tool to improve uh, our use of irrigation, have some, maybe some data-driven approaches to irrigating the landscape in particular, um, and you can see, we, you know, we're expecting about, we've had about uh, a half an inch uh, of rainfall. You can see where we are relative to normal. We were dry getting in the springtime here, uh, particularly up where we are. And now it's getting a little bit above normal, but nowhere near the moisture we were getting uh, in, in 2022. So interesting to see, uh, very easy to look at. Again, looks really good on a phone. Uh, very easy to decipher when you're trying to figure out rainfall amounts. Um, and we're expecting normal temps through the next week, which is in the 30s and 40s. So most people will not be accumulating, unless you're to the very far south of the region, uh, a lot of growing degree days. Now, there is a disparity uh, in the region. There are, I think the southern part of the region is much more advanced than we are north of New York City. So there's a real demarcation there. We heard from Rich Buckley yesterday that as soon as the rainfall is coming, it's on. Things are growing uh, things are popping down in, in central and, and certainly southern New Jersey and beyond. And we're expecting adequate rainfall, right? So this won't be limiting in any particular way. So, you know, you can expect things not to move very much, but also not to be limited by rainfall. Now, as we start to talk about grounds management, right, large scale grounds management, this probably could have been done better, uh, maybe with an applicator that uh, you know, actually disperse the material. Um, this is a, a, you know, a late season fertilizer application from a hotel room, uh, you know, looking down on it. So uh, a very interesting depiction of poor spring fertilization. So I do, I, I do, I do admire the fact they went two directions though, Frank. I know, you, <laughs> you have to admire that. They did two directions. For those of you watching on News Channel 10 here, you could you could see that checkered pattern. Cal is exactly right. So I decided to ask the machine, Cal, what we should do about spring fertilization. See, and as I want to see if you and me and Carl are as smart as the machine. So I typed in the question: should I fertilize my lawn this spring? And the machine says the decision to fertilize your lawn in the spring depends on a few factors. That's very nice. Grass type, climate condition of your lawn. So it's a good time. It's, they say it's a good idea to fertilize your lawn in the spring to encourage healthy growth, help it recover from winter damage. However, don't you know avoid 
or fertilizing. Excessive growth may require frequent mowing, increased risk of disease. Hell, they're not going to need us anymore, brother. We've done this already. So, so now I don't know if I should fertilize. It might be helpful to have a soil <laughs> test. I, I don't know if I want to fertilize, what type of fertilizers. Um, but it's generally safe to fertilize it in the spring. Just be sure to avoid um, not over fertilizing. So I just before I, I got I got I'm trying to set you up here, Cal. So Carl and I, mostly Carl, have been have worked with the Upper Susquehanna and Shemung watersheds uh, to develop these urban nutrient management uh, plan guidelines. Um, and we were acknowledged. I just put it up there, Carl. You got acknowledged there in the uh, publication. And we've decided to start to look at fertilizing the land that's turf grass um, as high traffic, um, generally just mature turf uh, that's mostly low traffic and newly established turf. And then within the first two types, we separated it out by soil types, sand-based and, and native soils, high traffic or low traffic. And we've given some guidance on, you know, amounts allowed in a single application. Some of this is guided by Marty's, Marty's and Doug's uh, research. And then uh, maximum annual amounts uh, here for the watershed uh, that we think you'd ever use, even on a sand-based system that receives some high traffic, right? So uh, we then said, well, how do you know uh, what you're doing here? So, and how do you know how you should fertilize based on your high traffic sand based systems? You have a high priority, a medium priority, a low level priority. What should you be paying attention to? What should you be doing relative to the kind of turf you have? Again, sand based, high traffic, low traffic, native soil, and then the, uh, the um, differentiation for the newly established turf, right? You're newly establishing, but it's a, a low, you know, it's very medium level priority. It's not a big priority. And then the big button here at the bottom, right, Carl, is the, if the turf's doing well, uh, don't fertilize it. And, and Dan Scheid here and I were yakking the other night over a beer and, 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 you know, we've gone from three fertilizations and, you know, two weed controls a year to one fertilizer and one weed control a year. So we've already on the campus here begun to make some big strides in, in reducing this usage. Now, Cal, you Ooh. presented this at the at the international meeting uh, on clover and 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 you had this great <coughs> chart here. I'm so I love preparing for these conversations. Thanks for again being willing to join us. So you guys put the clover in and then monitored the uh, dry matter production. Uh, from these lawns that you put the clover into. And the graph we're looking at here uh, depicts what happens when you don't put the clover in. Um, you put the clover in uh, and, 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 and don't fertilize it. And then you do those same things and then fertilize it, right? So I'd like to just stick with the, you know, the don't fertilize because the 98 kilos is two pounds a year, right? Correct. So that's within yeah. our range that we would do. But when you put clover in here, Kale, this must have been surprising for you. Let's start a little bit at that. Yeah, so this was a, a study, again, you know, looking at nutrient management and this idea of, you know, what could we potentially do for, you know, particularly utility areas, you know, that maybe are, are, are prone to maybe not very high density and somebody's interested in not having to invest in, you know, uh, synthetic fertilizers and all those other kinds of things. And, you know, I think it's important to mention, you know, this is that micro clover, okay? So this is, this is that more uh, compact uh, type of clover, a little bit smaller leaves, a little bit more attractive, actually mixed into the canopy um, in such a way that it, it wasn't, um, it wasn't aesthetically unpleasing. So it, it worked out pretty cool. Okay. Um, but I think what's interesting about this, this story is we were asking the question of, okay, if you have the micro clover in there and you are fertilizing, and again, legumes do fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. So there's, it was this concept of a self feeding lawn was, was what we were chasing down mm -hmm. um, is if you suddenly had say a lawn care company or you yourself started to add granular fertilizers, would that start to negate the effects of the clover over time? Mm -hmm. and, and, and as you look at this graph, uh, you know, the, the clover plus the nitrogen, certainly uh, you can see that top line uh, mm -hmm. on, the, on, on, the, on the left. Yeah. I mean, you got a lot of growth there. 
The other yeah. thing about clover is clover is a very, I'm, I'm going to use a very technical term here, a really juicy plant. <clears throat> it's really juicy in the sense that, that, you know, if you get a lot of clippings, those clippings, there's just a lot of water in there and you get a lot of material on the surface. So what we were actually doing, uh, my graduate student at the time, Gabe, is I was like, you know, this is not going to be fun, but you're going to do it, is he would go out there, he would mow, and then we would get his biomass measurements, he would dry those down, and then we actually would grind the clippings and return them back to the surface in order to make sure that we were getting everything back into the canopy. Wow. But it wasn't a crazy amount of plots, but it was, it was I really wanted this data. And I, I think um, obviously it's a hit with you. So that's a yeah, good thing. Yeah, well, I can tell you. Thank you, Cal. I, I'm telling you, thanks for doing this. And Carl, I know we got a nugget here from Cal today because we were just talking about we have a growth model Carl's developed and been working on. We're going to include it in some of these digital tools that we're developing here. Uh, and and I think that particular nugget is interesting. Now, Cal, so, so there's two things. One is, it looks like the second year was a real amplified effect. The slope of the line is, is more dramatic. Uh, was there something about the growing season that forced it to surge like that? Um, what do you think? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I had to go back and look a little bit. Um, you know, there was a supplemental irrigation system in place, but it's mm -hmm. not like we were watering a lot. Okay. okay. It was, okay. it was enough. I, I, we wanted to make sure we had an insurance policy in case right. we had a dry year. Right. Okay. right. Uh, there was a little bit more rainfall that particular year. Mm -hmm. And so it is possible there could have been some mineralization from the leaf litter of the clover in this situation. Okay. Um, so the well, other thing that's interesting is that with no fertilizer, you're getting more <laughs> biomass production. And, you know, Correct. one of the things we talk about with as far as weeds or the benefit of a, a good a turf in an urban landscape is 100% cover, right? Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. don't want crabgrass in particular filling in. You don't want a lot of annual weeds uh, filling in. If I'm getting some additional growth, I wonder if that's enough to keep out some other weeds. Did you recall, did you use pre's on this or was there any effect of this actually keeping the weeds at bay? So there were a few situations. Um, again, we minimized the pesticides here uh, right. as far as you know, having to deal with some of those things. The, the site didn't have a, a strong history of crabgrass, so that wasn't a big deal. Okay. Um, you know, the, the clover that was there, you know, over time, like the third year, um, mm -hmm. I think if you were to make this work is you would still need to do some uh, interseeding or overseeing of the clover because there were times that it, it, it started to become a little bit patchy. Okay. Frank, I think the other thing that's interesting is the second line there. Yep. If we were to get crazy and look at, you know, the actual slopes of those lines, yep. uh, the, the, the grass clover, no nitrogen lines actually look like they're fairly similar in terms of their, their, their sort of slow and steady growth over yeah. the period of the, uh, yeah. of, of the study. But yeah. But to your point where you're putting in the nitrogen, that really jacked things up. Yeah. And, and again, that would result in excess mowing. So, yeah. so I think our, our moves towards these sustainable lawns from a nutritional standpoint, if people are willing to you know, think outside the box, there, there's some potential there. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so um, the other thing the machine said was that grass type mattered. And so I got mm -hmm. another, I know you're an expert in tall fescue, so I want to take up tall fescue. You know, these are Doug's, uh, sold that it's famous plots from a number of years ago where he looked at planting them and then looking at different fertilizer amounts. And I use this to get a lot of tall fescue mm -hmm. uh, planted in New York, even when I first got here. The improvements in the tall fescues, particularly as you move north, Cal, uh, are a big deal. Now, where you are, they're, they're the standard, right? They'll, they'll do as well uh, as anything down there, I think, won't they? Uh, part particularly on these new subdivision soils, right? Yeah. And so that's that's where I get a little bit, you know, these newer subdivisions where, you know, they're coming in and they're just they're just packing houses in and they're scraping soil off is, you know, when I talk about Kentucky bluegrass and you look at the textbook definition, it prefers moist, fertile, well-drained soils, that's right? right. <laughs> and, and that's great coming from the sod farms out what used to be a corn farm here in the yeah. Corn Belt. Yeah. But when you put it on these new like scraped soils, they struggle. I mean, That's the right. sod and the bluegrass has struggled, but the tall fescues are more tolerant. Yeah, yeah. And you still. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So listen, this is our tall fescue, fescue story. This is a courtyard that was built here at the School of Industrial Labor Relations at Cornell University. Um, and it actually was built in a way that uh, created, it allowed it to be two zones warmer. 
So mm -hmm. this little courtyard was with plants that are in there, landscape plants that are in there, actually are plants that will grow and thrive only as far north as DC. So mm -hmm. we have a really nice uh, uh, experiment here right. in the middle. Yeah. So we, you know, <laughs> we did what exactly what you said. They scraped it off. And then they mixed in some compost, right? Look at the look at the mess of the soil uh, that they created here. Uh, but the landscape plants get treated like gold. The grass, not so much. So eventually, we got a beautiful turf type tall fescue uh, sod, uh, a ninety percent tall fescue, ten percent Kentucky bluegrass uh, sod that one of our uh, alum uh, provided. And you can see when you got it in there and that landscape is happening, it's, it's just as good as it gets. Right. So let's look at it after, uh, the first winter kale, Woo! lot of snow mold came in. I think, uh, mm -hmm. we found out how much bluegrass we had because the tall fescue, uh, out of the gate struggled a little, little bit, but so did the bluegrass. So did some of the bluegrass in this particular year, but because of where this was at, it started to, we didn't, we didn't do anything. This is just recovery within uh, a month or so. I see, I, I picked up your, uh, I, I had this habit a while ago. I wish I would have put the dates on it when I did it, but we're talking about a month's time here. And then June comes and we have the tents and the chairs for graduation. And you can see it's by the fall, it's, it's doing pretty good. And you know, it actually has been doing really well now, uh, year on year. Now, congratulations, my friend, on receiving the Daniels Award. This is great news. Congratulations that you got from the Sports Fields Managers Association mm -hmm. at their recent conference in, in January out in Salt Lake City. And so for all the young people listening who know, don't know Bill Daniels, I knew Bill Daniels uh, when he was at Purdue because I was a kid. And he spoke at conferences uh, I used to go to, and Bill was the original uh, developer, uh, developer of the Perwick system, right? The Perwick system. Yeah, the Perwick system. That's right? an interesting Perwick. one. Yeah. But the yeah. Pat, the Pat system on the stadium fields is a little more successful. That's right. But the but the Perwick led to the Pat, right? The Perwick Correct. was the precursor to the Pat. So Cal, this is great recognition of your wonderful career, and you celebrate it by tweeting out things like <laughs> killing moles, right? You're that's the, not me. That's, that's not me. Not that, 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 that's a relocation program. There, there's no there's no death involved here, Frank, as far as you know. <laughs> have you uh, th this is very interesting. And, you know, I have a, a couple of, you know, a couple of simple questions. But what about moles? Um, do have you had a worse problem? Have you seen a worse problem? Have you heard about problems? Maybe because it was a milder winter? Um, you know, we, we consistently at our turf research facility have some, just some locations that historically seem to have populations that like to come back. And so, uh, we have some staff folks that, you know, sort certainly monitor these and, uh, uh, you know, we, we have a fence around our research facility to try and protect the turf. So occasionally you need to relocate some things, uh, that maybe are not in alignment with the, uh, the mission of the facility. Okay. <laughs> relocate them with a, with a spear. <laughs> well, uh, I, I, you know, I, I can neither confirm nor deny. But. Okay, so, okay, you took these great pictures, right, uh, of the Purdue uh, main campus. Um, this was in January, mm -hmm. and you were in the 50s. January 3rd, February 9th, you were at 26. Yep. Uh, February 26th, you can see the frost, and this yep. was just recently down. Yep, that was last so, weekend, yep. So as I, so, you know, we got a couple of minutes for questions. I asked the machine <laughs> about a limerick for you. Uh, please give me a limerick about Cale Bigelow that's, at Purdue. And it says, oh, that's, at that's Purdue, funny. there's a professor named Cale whose expertise in turf is beyond the pale. He studies grasses galore from fairways to lawn decor. Cale Bigelow's the turf expert without fail. Wow. How about that, Cale? Wow. That, How about that's... that? I am honored. I am honored. <laughs> All right, so listen, you're not done yet. How do you like tall fescue? It, the, what are the limitations for many years uh, in your experience of having tall fescue? What are the things you tell people, you know, transitioning now that you're seeing it more in these places? What are you noticing? Um, if there are any limitations, it might be spring color, right? I mean, you know, particularly in our environment and maybe a little bit in yours, you know, we do get those winter desiccating winds and you get sort of that, that little bit of leaf tip, you want, I don't know if you want to call it wind burn or whatever. And, and it's a little bit, you know, slow to kind of come out of that. Um, 
the other limitations maybe are, you know, the, the leaf texture used to be a big thing, but, but uh, you know, I've got a grad student right now, PhD student, and she's done some, some pretty detailed measurements with leaf width on some of these things, and they're highly compatible with the Kentucky bluegrasses. Um, the only other thing, you know, it, in certain situations, it could get a little clumpy, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it is a bunch type grass. So I think that, it, you know, mixing something like a Kentucky bluegrass at a certain amount is, is probably appropriate. Or routine uh, overseeding, routine uh, overseeding as a, as a practice. Yes. And then, you know, the, the, the bigger issue, but, you know, we've got some really strong genetics now, you know, our breeding friends have done some really, you know, really great work. strides in terms 100%. of brown patch resistance, That's right. but this has happened, you know, if you talk to our friends in North Carolina, there's a little bit of the concern on the gray leaf spot. Gray leaf spot. You're exactly you know, right. Mel Melody Fraser and Jim Kearns down in North Carolina, they've, they've increasingly seen some of the gray leaf spots sneaking into some plots. And, you know, that's that's a hit or a miss. That's that's right. a lottery card, right? And right. It is now, uh, you know, ever since Buckley cursed us and said he never saw a gray leaf spot on tall fescue and he did it in, yeah. the, you know, in our conference call. Carl, other questions? Yeah, so we got a good one about, about the turf type tall fescue. So Rich said he had a turf type tall fescue blend with micro clover sod. Mm. He had an irrigated, yep, irrigated site, sod, yep, irrigated site and non irrigated site. He said the irrigated site got hammered with white clover and the non irrigated site was, was fine. And he's wondering why would we see that, uh, the, the white clover moving in on the irrigated site as opposed to the non irrigated site? I honest, I mean, yeah. I don't know. That's tough. I, I just don't know. But you know, so, Frank, so, you've seen that you've seen this before in, in a dry site, like a super dry, crispy kind of thing. The clover will be like some of the greenest stuff sitting out there in the middle of the summer. You know, you'll see the big patch of clover, everything else around it's kind of off color and brown. And this clover is just like, so it, clover's more drought tolerant than I think we give it credit for. I, I agree 100%. It's certainly, if nothing else, certainly spurs flowering. So, mm -hmm. Carl, I'm trying to read this question here. They use Black Beauty micro clover sod, one with the irrigation. The one irrigated had the, the so they put it in two places. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. Irrigation had more clover, no irrigation was, it says it was fine. I'm assuming yeah. fine means there was no clover. And I guess my question is, why did you buy clovered sod? I think he's making the distinction between white clover and, and the micro clover in there, maybe. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Kale, this is a better question than I thought. Huh. And we're, Carl, we're past the time, but this is a good one. Yeah. I have a hard time differentiating it. Do you really believe they're separate species or do you think the micro clover is simply an adaptation to more close, frequent mowing? Um, the micro clover is genetically different. I mean, they're, they're, they're still ge same genus species, just like the three of us are the same genus species. Right. But we right. all look different. Right? right. I mean, none of us can, none of us can grow Carl's beard. Right. I mean, that's, no. I mean, look at, look at that thing. <laughs> uh, so, 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 so we look, we look similar, but different. Mm -hmm. um, and the micro clover definitely does not grow as tall and the leaves are probably at least half the size. I wonder if you juiced it though, or you had water on on it yeah. and it was a really fertile sod if maybe it got more plump and juicy to use your maybe brown patch maybe brown patch got in there and, and thinned, thinned, thinned it out a little bit i, I don't know but the white it's, clover it's, itself he says thrived which you know that's again to make sure there's separating two uh separate species yeah, because yeah, yeah. you know in the marketplace you do see just white clover being sold you don't always see micro clover so yeah, that's correct. a really important distinction carl we can't be the fastest 30 minutes and be four minutes over so cal thank you very much for taking the time i hope you i hope you enjoyed spending this time and yeah, yeah, with great. you me carl and the machine uh the machine. telling us what to do <laughs> excellent ex excellent limericks from the machine today we're gonna have to do that for every guest from now That's on right. Frank. <laughs> thanks everyone for joining us hey rich send me some more information about this uh yeah, this please call fescue site because this is yeah. interesting yeah um but thanks, thanks everybody we'll see, see you guys carl then. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.